Welcome to FACT's webinar called Sheep and Goats Raising Browsers and Grazers, presented by Jim Bourne and Tony Koch, and uh, hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director and also Director of our Fund a Farmer Project. I will be moderating the webinar this evening, and I'm very thankful for all of you for joining us. So just a few quick uh, introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization. We are headquartered in Chicago. Uh, we work nationally. We, pr we promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. Like I said, I direct FACT's Fund a Farmer Project, with, which awards grants and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education opportunities to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. So at this time, I'm delighted to introduce our two presenters, both of whom I'm happy to report um, are also past Fund a Farmer grant recipients. Our first speaker tonight will be James, or Jim Bourne of the Lambs Quarter, a historic farm in Owings, Maryland, which is approximately an hour east of Washington, DC. And you might recognize Jim from our Meet CSA webinar, which aired last month. Tonight, Jim will talk about his experience raising sheep including breed selection, stocking densities, lambing, shelter, fencing, as well as some of the common health issues that sheep face and some ideas about how to treat them. <clears throat> Our second speaker this evening is Tony Koch of Koch Ranches, which is located outside of San Antonio, Texas. Koch Ranches is a family business that is owned and operated by fifth, sixth, and now seventh generation Texas farmers and ranchers. Tony and his family raise several types of cattle, sheep, goats and wild boar on 4,400 acres of pasture land. This evening, Tony will share his insight about raising grass-fed sheep and goats for meat. So it's certainly an honor to have both of our presenters with us this evening. They will be available to answer your questions later on in the webinar. Um, at this point, I'm going to yield the floor to Jim so that he may start our first presentation. And here you go, Jim. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jim Bourne um, from the Lambs Quarter. Um, and just uh, has a word of, um, I don't know, clarification. When I named my farm the Lambs Quarter, I had no idea that everybody thought that I would have lamb available because this was a vegetable farm and Lambs Quarter is a weed. Um, nobody really realized that. so. Uh, that prompted me uh, to get sheep about six years ago, just so I could finally uh, say to my customers at the farmer's market, yeah, I've got lamb. And so I've had sheep for about six years now. Um, i titling this thing the reflections of a novice because honestly, there's a lot more out there, a lot of uh, better educated people than I am. Uh, I just wanna really share my experiences, what I've learned, I've learned a lot through hard knocks. Um, and uh, sheep are really a, um, far more sensitive than ca the cattle that we used to raise here on the farm. Uh, and I thought that I could step into the sheep business and use everything that I knew about cows and be fine. And I couldn't. Uh, there are some things that were uh, easy to transfer across, and there are other things where Sheep are just a whole lot uh, more sensitive and really a, a different ball game altogether. So we get started. But one thing I encourage you, I, I noticed that uh, several of you aren't, um, uh, don't have any sheep or goats yet, and you may be thinking about it. One of the first questions to ask before you jump into this venture is, how are you going to make money on them? Uh, what is your market? And that first, uh, that question uh, generates some other questions here. Who are my customers and what do they want? Um, are you near any ethnic communities? Um, lamb is uh, very popular uh, around Easter, as we all know, but if you live near a Muslim community and you will find uh, your Muslim neighbors who are asking for lamb at, during the Eid holiday, Right after, which is right after Ramadan. Um, you want to sell breeding stock. 
Uh, do you want to have a registered uh, flock of sheep and sell breeding stock? Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly something that you could do to market your, uh, market your sheep. We, uh, at the Lambs Quarter, we do farmer's markets. We do uh, four different farmer's markets um, in Northern Virginia, and we do a, a CSA as well, direct marketing to a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. Um, if you're not near a uh, populated area, um, but you want to get involved in raising sheep, there's always the sale barn, uh, the auction floor, where you can sell your lambs. <clears throat> Again, timing is everything with that. And uh, they're also going to be sensitive to the holidays where uh, lamb is, um, is going to be popular. There's dairy sheep. Uh, and then there's the, the wool market, uh, pelts, and of course, uh, meat. Now, we're, what we raise are, um, are typical meat sheep. Um, I'm not really interested in, in wool, and uh, I'll explain that in a few more slides here. Uh, there's a not so great picture of our farmer's market stand in Alexandria taken during the winter, but uh, we also sell uh, beef, pork, chicken, as well as lamb. And I think at that point in our uh, experience, we were selling vegetables as well. Breed selection. The breed selection really does tie into uh, what you want your market to be, how you want to market your product. Um, there's the first question of, do you want wool sheep or do you want hair sheep? There are, most sheep are wool bearing sheep. There are a few breeds, like the Dorfers or the Katadins, that are hair sheep and that will shed. You don't need to shear them. When I was uh, investigating uh, getting my sheep, one thing I didn't really want to deal with was the shearing factor. I didn't want to learn how to do it. I really didn't have any good contacts for uh, finding somebody to shear. So we went. Uh, with the hair sheep. Um, there's, there's good things about hair sheep. Um, there's other things about hair sheep that make them more like goats than sheep at times, um, especially when it comes to fencing. They're really, really hard on fences. But um, you know, that's a question that you need to ask yourself. Do I want to, do I want to shear or do I want the sheep that will actually have hair and shed themselves, shed that, that hair? Heritage breeds. Um, are you interested in, in selling breeding stock and keeping a lot of these heritage breeds that are out there? And then uh, you need to ask yourself about the land that you're going to use to uh, graze your flock on. Um, is it fine, pristine pasture land? Is it average grassland? Or is it a little rough? Do you live east of the Mississippi in a temperate climate or do you live west of the Mississippi? in a somewhat more arid, dry climate. Um, all of these things are going to influence the breed of sheep that you have. Some sheep are much more thrifty on poor pastures, and they will be your small to medium breeds. Once you get into your large frame sheep, they demand um, really good pasture and uh, usually some supplemental feeds as well. Uh, this is a picture of my Katahdins. Uh, they're a hair type sheep. Uh, again, a lot of them are white, but they will also come in these multicolored um, splotchiness. The, the sheep there, the U on the uh, right is Tess, and she's part of my foundation stock. I started off with um, about 20 sheep, um, 15 to 20 sheep, and um, learned a lot of painful lessons that first year. Um, this is a picture of a Clun Forest sheep. Now, this is a uh, heritage breed, a uh, bull type sheep, and she's nursing her twins. That is a beautiful ewe. Um, and she is, uh, there's also value not only in, um, in the wool, obviously, but there's, they also raise good lambs uh, with uh, good carcasses. 
So we, we talked a little bit about, um, about pasture land, but it does have a lot to do with what kind of breed that you're gonna use. This information uh, that you see on your screen right now, I got off the web and it comes from um, University of Massachusetts. Um, and that's the link up there. And it talks, this whole article talks about livestock grazing and stocking rates. Um, the basis of, um, of stocking rate, and I was looking for something applicable to me since I'm east of the Mississippi. There's a lot of good information out in Idaho, by uh, University of Idaho and the land grant colleges that are west of the Mississippi, if you live out there, looking for something east of the Mississippi. But um, essentially, at a, they rate stocking rates by the amount of animal units a, an acre of pasture can carry. An animal unit is always 1,000 pounds. So obviously, a ewe uh, is only part of, you know, it's going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2 um, animal units. And essentially, you can put a lot more uh, ewes with lambs on pasture than you can cows. Uh, just in terms of animal um, numbers, animal numbers. Uh, again, you can increase your stocking rate if you have excellent quality pastures and you rotate your pastures. You uh, do good fertilization, uh, low erosion. Uh, if you happen to give supplemental feed, um, of course, you can increase your stocking rate. Um, and but if you're if you don't have pristine pastures like uh, like me and you need uh, an animal that's not too picky and is fairly thrifty, uh, again, a cahadin works really well. Everybody wants to know about fencing and facilities uh, when it comes to sheep and of course especially goats. Um, but with uh, with us here, we had. Uh, a traditional four-strand barbed wire fence that we use for our cattle. Uh, I made the decision when we went into sheep. Um, I, at that point, I had gotten rid of all of my cows. I sold a blast of my cows when the um, market was incredibly high, and it was a good time to get out. Uh, I got into the sheep because I, I wanted something that would give me a return on investment in, within a 12-month period of time. And um, with feeder cattle uh, doing finishing out cows, you're looking at a 24 to 30-month window there. Uh, with a lamb, uh, you can finish a lamb on grass um, with either very little supplemental feed or no supplemental feed at all, depending on your pasture, in about eight months. Um, and that, that's been a, a very aggressive uh, point for us in our marketing. But you've got a fence for them. And a four-strand barbed wire fence absolutely is not going to stop a cahadin you from going through it and getting to the grass that you know is always going to be greener on the other side. Um, we've tried a, a, a variety of fences. Um, so the first point there is a physical barrier versus a psychological barrier. A physical barrier um, is something like a woven wire fence, uh, barbed wire, high tensile wire. Um, psychological barrier, that's gonna be your electric fence. There's poly wire, which is a temporary wire that is uh, nylon with uh, stainless steel strands uh, woven into it. There is netting fence that they is typically used for poultry, but can also be used for um, all other animals uh, from sheep and goats and uh, hogs, et cetera, and low and high tensile wire fences that can be electrified. Again, with electric fence, your fence is only as good as the fence charger and your the power source that's charging it. If that battery runs down on your electric fence, your animals are going to figure that out 
well before you do. Um, from my experience um, with my Katahdins, I, uh, I wouldn't recommend a netting fence, um, even with the fence on. If they get frightened by something, they will bowl through that fence and get tangled up into it. Um, and then you're out there with the scissors and a panicked you, and you're trying to save the used life by uh, ruining a $100, $200 fence. Um, it, it's not a scenario that worked for us. If your sheep are uh, tamer than mine, uh, more docile, um, then that may work for you. Um, we've had fairly good luck with woven wire um, using a 30, 32 inch hog wire with uh, barbed wire at the bottom. Um, and that's, that keeps, tends to keep them in place. Um, sometimes it would, even with that, it would help to run a strand of electric wire right at that bottom because they tend to want to get underneath and push up on that fence. Um, they're very aggressive animals. I, uh, with, I think the, the hair sheep are more aggressive on a fence than uh, typical wool sheep. And I've uh, literally had my Kahadans lift the gates up and uh, take them off the pegs, uh, off the hooks. So uh, they can be challenging. Um, another thing to, to ask yourself is uh, intensive versus extensive. Do you have a, a large space that you can run for, um, for your pasture, or do you need to be more intensive because you don't have that much space, don't have that many facilities, or you have better facilities? An extensive situation, you wouldn't really need a lot of uh, facilities. Uh, a shed or two would be fine. Uh, barns, sheds, and run-ins, uh, what do you have in place? Um, what do you anticipate? I really, really like building um, eight foot high, uh, 16 foot wide hoop houses, and you can run them out uh, 48 feet and cover them with a uh, silage cover and keep them uh, dark. Um, they're, they're very versatile buildings uh, and can be used for many things. You're going to need handling facilities. Again, um, there, nothing can replace having a really good book um, and, of course, access to the Internet, which obviously we all do tonight, uh, to look up uh, these things and, and get some really, really good ideas. And, of course, lambing pens. Um, we do pasture lambing. I do not put my ewes up. Uh, I will put them up after they've lambed in the field um, if those lambs look weak. And um, I'll have a couple slides here uh, later on. A uh, picture of a fence that I, uh, I built uh, about a month ago. Again, putting lambs up into this area here. Good steel gate, woven wire, um, uh, supported uh, telephone poles that had been cut in half with steel uh, T-posts driven down. Um, it's, it's done very well for us. A uh, picture of the my big shed that uh, we, we will uh, put the, all the sheet up in in very inclement weather. And there I've put uh, hay down along the sides so that um, I'm spread them out and let them eat. Right now we're running about, uh, uh, I guess it's 60 sheep in the field with, uh, we've got 23 lambs that have dropped this spring. And that's a picture of a lambing pen. Um, that, uh, that you with, and she's got twins in there. Um, she delivered on Saturday, and I had to deliver one of her lambs. Uh, the second one was uh, locked into the birth canal with the uh, head looking back over the shoulder. Um, it can be a difficult birth, and without help, she would have never uh, delivered that lamb. And best thing of all, it was delivered alive. Um, okay, working sheep. Uh, is a dog in your future? And there's two different kinds of dogs, uh, generally. Uh, a guardian dog, if you have issues with um, predators. We really don't here. 
um, in this part of Maryland. Uh, coyotes are not an issue at this point with us, and uh, foxes would rather get my chickens than get the lambs. So um, we don't, at this point, uh, foresee needing a guardian dog. However, I um, am going to be getting a border collie um, next month and training that so that we can uh, have a little help uh, rounding up the sheep and gathering them and all the good things that border collies are known to do. So again, uh, depending on uh, how big you want to get, um, you may want to uh, get that herding dog. Okay, some general words on parasites and general health issues. Um, the Maryland Extension Small Ruminant Program Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, please um, find this page and like it. It has valuable information, links to all kinds of great um, articles out there. It's a, it's a real education. If sim simply reading everything they put out on their Facebook page, if you uh, follow them. A um, couple things on parasites. I learned the hard way. Parasites will kill sheep um, before you realize what's happening. And then, like I alluded to that first year, um, it was a trial by fire for us. Um, and there were a lot of, uh, found a lot of sheep with hooves in the air that year. And it was due to parasites. Uh, you cannot leave your sheep on the same pasture. Uh, for more than 30 days. Um, it's just a death sentence for them, uh, especially if it's a small pasture and you're uh, trying to force them to eat everything. It's just got to keep them moving. They're not as tough as cows, um, and um, it's no fun uh, having to deal with that. The One of the things I learned uh, during that time, I called my vet. Really, really good to have a vet on call, and I do. I have a, a wonderful vet, and I can talk to him over the phone. And uh, Dr. Chris was very blunt with me. He said, "You could do all the parasite intervention that you want with ivermectin and um, all the other drugs, or you can work on building a parasite-resistant herd or a parasite-resistant flock, and do good pasture management." Um, choice is yours. And so I opted for um, better pasture management and culling out the uh, ewes that were susceptible to parasites. And um, since that time, I don't believe I've only lost one other uh, ewe to parasites. Um, again, it's, um, it's what you want to do, it's what you choose to do. Uh, there is a real issue with the wormer resistance, so you need to um, move that along and uh, rotate your dewormers if you use them. And I keep dewormer with me as well. I mean, if, you're, if I see something that needs treatment, you got to treat it. Um, rotating pastures, though, that is uh, that is critical to breaking that cycle of, of parasites. And then learning to recognize parasite-related issues. Again, there's an excellent program out there. I have not taken it yet, but it involves looking at the eyelid and scoring um, the eyelid. Apparently, that uh, gives you excellent information as to uh, the amount of parasites there. It's a whole program. Uh, again, that information is out there, and I know it's on the Maryland Small Maryland Extension Small Ruminant Program Facebook page. Um, watch for bloat. Um, I've got horror stories from this past year about that. Um, bloat will kill your sheep, and sheep are very, very susceptible to bloat. And sheep are also copper sensitive. Watch your minerals. Um, you cannot feed beef minerals to sheep. You cannot feed goat minerals to sheep. Um, uh, copper will kill your sheep. Uh, if you want to 
vaccinate, find out what vaccines uh, you need to be using. Have a good, have good handling facility. Um, get yourself a good dog that'll help you. As with anything, with anything farming, an ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. Um, watch your animals. There's no, nothing out there that can replace your good observation. If an animal doesn't look right, it's probably because something's not quite right. Find out what it is. Cultivate a good relationship with a good vet and get yourself a good library. Um, again, uh, a good library, uh, good vet, just wonderful things to have. Lambing, um, I alluded to that lamb or that you this past Saturday, um, the lamb there that she's looking on the right, um, that lamb was born about five minutes before I took that picture. And that was the lamb that I, uh, I had to deliver because it had the head looking back over its shoulder. Um, this is my daughter. We had to put that, uh, those lambs up into a pen and she's walking backwards and um, that's the best way to get the ewe into the pen. Uh, she will follow the lambs. There's no sense in, in driving her because she's not even uh, close to being acceptable to something like that. And that's the happy family inside uh, the pen. Land grant universities in your state are a good place um, to get yourself educated. Uh, Find the resources. Just about every uh, land grant university has something out there with uh, small ruminants, goats, and sheep. Story's Guide to Raising Sheep is my go-to book. Um, if, if there's a book that you need to get, that's the one. Uh, find out if there's a local extension agent that uh, is good with sheep or goats. And um, an excellent magazine if you are into rotational grazing um, and sense of pasture management is the Stockman Grass Farmer. Um, most of the articles in there are geared towards the beef producer, uh, but a lot of the information there uh, touches on to rotational grazing for sheep, et cetera. And that's me. Thank you, thank you very much, Jim. Um, Jim will be available later in the webinar to answer all sorts of questions. I'm going to pass the mic now to Tony from Coke Ranches. Here you go, Tony. <laughs> Tony, are you still muted? You might be. Yes, you are. You're still muted. <clears throat> Tony, can you hear me? So Tony, to, un to unmute, just go to the top screen, hover over that microphone and click it and you will be unmuted. Tony, are you there? <laughs> One moment, please, everyone. I'm sorry. We are just experiencing just a little bit of a technical glitch. So, Tony, to unmute, just go to the top. Hover over the microphone and click it, and it, you should become unmuted. So while we're waiting for, for Tony, um, Jim, do you want to come back on and answer any um, questions that have come up so far about sheep? That's fine, and, uh, you know, so get some 
Tony doesn't reestablish, I can offer a few words on, on goats as well. That, that, that sounds great. I have one question to begin with, um, is something that seems like people go either, oh, I think that's Tony. Okay, Tony, I'm yes, Okay, am. good. Excellent. We are going to hold the questions then, and we're going to let Tony talk. Thank you. All right, my name is Tony Cook. Uh, I ranch 4,400 acres here in South Texas, and uh, we raise between anywhere between 200 and 250 sheep, uh, and about 300 to 350 goats. Uh, as as was mentioned before, fences are the number one thing that you got to you got to be aware of the fencing. They will not stay in a barbed wire fence. So you have to have a netting fence. And you need a netting fence that's about three three inches by three inches. The square should not be larger than that because goats are notorious for sticking their head through those those openings. And once a goat's head gets through there, it gets hung up on its horns. Uh, predators, we are overrun with predators in South Texas. I have guard dogs with our with our sheep and uh, our goat herds. Uh, we we are constantly setting out snares and putting out poison for for uh, coyotes, bobcats, or foxes, and all kinds of, of animals that love to eat baby goats. Our pastures, we rotate our pastures. We have about 10 separate pastures that we rotate our sheep and goats through. So that helps us a lot with the, with the parasite problems. We still do wormers from time to time, but as Jim said, you need to watch them. You really need to watch your animals to make sure that they're maintaining their health and they're not being eaten up by parasites. Uh, there are there are hair goats as well as meat goats, and we raise meat goats. Angora goats uh, that raise mohair, they they've kind of fallen out of favor because the wool and, and mohair subsidies that the government used to pay have been taken away. So people today are raising meat goats rather than, than hair goats. Uh, the demand for goat meat in the U.S. outruns production. And of all the meats that are eating, uh, that are being eaten worldwide, goat meat is the number one meat that is eaten worldwide. There are about 2 million uh, goats in the U.S. today, and that's an increase of about 400% over what was here in 1990, in 1987. 86% of all goat producers sell direct to the consumer. Uh, the end of the wool and goat hair subsidy has encouraged hair goat producers to switch to meat goat production. We have a store in San Antonio where we sell our meats and we have all kinds of other healthy foods there. We run a grass-fed operation. We don't give them any antibiotics. We don't give any kind of, of uh, chemicals or any kind of steroids or anything like that to any of our animals. We also sell at farmers markets, we sell wholesale, and we have a CSA program. Uh, handling facilities, you need to be able to pin them up, and in our case, we run them through the same facilities that we run our cattle and our sheep through. Uh, they run down a, a long, uh, uh, row and at the end we have a, a squeeze chute that can be adjusted and we usually put our goats into those squeeze chutes unless we're going to do some some quick work on them that doesn't need that i believe that that's just about all that i've got to say uh 
the pasture, you want goats or browsers. There are more so browsers than there are grazers. Sheep are grazers and they eat grass and forbs, whereas the goat prefers to eat off of a bush. They eat, they eat all kinds of, of leaves and brush and stuff like that in our country. Uh, I think that I've, I've got pretty much covered everything that I need to cover on those. That sounds good. Did you want to say anything else about sheep, Tony, before we open up for questions and answers? Well, I think Jim did a great job on covering sheep. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, he really covered it thoroughly, so I don't believe I've got anything to, to add to it other than in our country, with all the predators that we have in, in our area, we have, we have guard dogs that live with the herds. So they move with the herds, they live out in the pasture with the herds, and uh, we, we have feeder boxes for them that we drag around to the different pastures with the dogs. Excellent, okay. Well, that's, that is very good. I think that there are gonna be a lot of um, more specific questions that you guys will probably <clears throat> have a lot of insight into. Um, so, but before we start the q and I, I just want to do one last poll. Um, one moment, please. So this is after you watch this <laughs> the last 35 minutes. Um, how do you feel? Do you feel more knowledgeable about raising goats and sheep? About the same or less knowledgeable? And this is, again, just for our kind of internal purposes. Um, it's not... You, you can be honest, and uh, we won't we won't know who, what your vote is. Okay, but just another minute. All right. Well, thank you for your votes. So, as we open up the uh, questions and answers. Um, uh, from the audience, uh, I will ask everyone to type into that left hand bar and we will refer the questions to the various presenters. Let me just start with one. Um, I, I know that um, tail docking is a little bit of a, I don't know if it's controversial or not, but I've heard different things about it and um, people use it to re reduce or prevent uh, fly strike. And I'm just wondering, um, both of you, Tony and Jim, um, do you do you practice do you tail dock? And if so, why? Or so if you don't, then how do you get around um, a, a fly strike? We'll start with, we'll start with Tony. I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Oh, the question is about tail docking for sheep and oh, okay. whether it's something that you practice. I know that people use it um, for to prevent or to reduce the incidence of fly strike. And I don't know if that's something that your operation um, uses. We do not tail dock. And how do you get around whatever the issues are? Just more space for the, the animals or is it more of a climate thing? I guess it's more of a climate thing in our part of the world. Uh, we don't feel a need to do it. I know a lot of people do it in in other in other parts of the country, but in Texas, most people don't tail dog. And how about you, Jim? Do you have any insight about that? No, I uh, I don't tail dog with the yeah. uh, sheep, um, and I'm not completely sure of all the issues that uh, go into it. But uh, no, we don't we don't do the tail dog. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Okay, we have a question here. Um, so the question is, we haven't bought sheep to start. If we have a goal of 16 new by year three, should we start with two rams and two ewes or one ram and more ewe? We don't want to, um, to spend money on ready to go stock. Um, so that's the first question. What would a good kind of start starter plan be for with a goal of 16 ewes by you know, three years in. Jim, do you have any insight about that? Hmm. 
I would start. I would start with more U's and fewer fewer Rams. Yeah, I think Tony's right there. Um, one one Ram is going to service um, all the U's that she's going to need to, uh, or this person is going to need to get to uh, 16 in, in the three-year time period. Um, Make, make that uh, extra RAM and turn that into uh, one RAM in three years. Okay, so it sounds like, yes, one RAM would be enough. Um, the follow up question is Would you follow goats with sheep in rotation or should you run them separately? How about to you, um, Jim? Um, I think I'd run them uh, the same because they're really. Um, you're dealing with different, they're going to be eating different things. As Tony said, um, your goats are browsers and your sheep are grazers. Um, so they're going to be going after different things. Knowing that, um, you want to make sure, I think, that you have a, a pasture setup that can, that can accommodate both of them because of your different um, uh, forcing abilities. We're getting a little bit of weird feedback. Um, I'm not sure who it's coming from, Tony or, or Jim, but just to be conscious of it. Um, Tony, do you have any insight about um, rotation and following goats? And, uh, we, we, run, we run our herds in separate pastures. We run the goats in one and, and sheep in another, and they're about three months apart. So uh, we, we have 10 pastures, and we're we're only using two at a time. Good. Um, and to that question, what is the best type of fencing we have um, inquiry to keep goats from getting out? I think you went over that a little bit, Tony, but maybe elaborate about goat well, fencing. We, we use goat-proof fencing. It's it's a three by three netting. It's forty-seven inches high. And it it works perfectly. We don't have any problems with the goats getting out. Uh, the only problem we have is the predators digging under it. And uh, as far as as keeping the sheep and the goats inside, it 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 works perfectly. Now, do you, another question has to do with trimming hooves for sheep and goats. That's kind of a Follow up, I think, on the, the question I had about um, tail tail docking. But do you all, uh, Jim and uh, Jim and Tony, do you practice um, hoof trimming on your animals? We'll start with Tony. We do not. Uh, we have a lot of rocks in our area, so they they keep their hooves pretty well trimmed by walking through the rocks. And Jim, any any insight about that? No, I, I don't. I don't uh, do any hook trimming. Um, every once in a while, I have a um, have a ewe that comes up with a sore foot, and we'll do a little trimming if necessary. But uh, no, I don't have any regular basis for trimming. Thank you for that. So we next question is: We own a dairy and have extra ewes and rams. What is the best market and avenue to sell dairy sheep? I know that you all don't. Um, uh, deal with dairy, the dairy side of type of sheep, but do you have any insight or thoughts about uh, what to do with extras? Jim, I'll, I'll give that question to you first. Um, I really don't. I, I see that the, uh, the question is from uh, Iowa. Um, you know, I don't know what the, um, what the business is out there in terms of uh, are there other dairies or do they have a sail barn that can accommodate something like that? Um, you know, I, I, I don't really know where to start there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, do you have anything to add? No, I really don't. I don't I'm not familiar at all with dairy feet. So we have, we have, thank you for, for that information. Um, I have a question from someone also in Maryland, Jim. Um, the question is, when you move your animals out to pasture. When do you move them out to pasture in the spring, or are they outside in pasture all year? All year round. Um, I try to uh, 
have a good stockpile of fescue um, going into the, into the winter time and some of the back pastures. Um, I'm also letting them graze over some ground that I have. Uh, um, and I had to feed less than a dozen bales of hay. Um, a square bale of hay this year. Again, I'm only uh, pushing about uh, 60 feet that into consideration. So two two big round bales and I left them in the Everything else. Jim, are you? I'm sorry. I sorry to interrupt you. Are you? Um, I feel like I think that we're getting feedback from your computer. I don't know why, because it wasn't happening when you were presenting. No, I I, I feel it too, and I don't know what's going on. <laughs> okay, it's just something that happens on these webinars. Um, okay, so thanks for elaborating about that. Next question is actually from someone from Texas. Uh, what do you do about the lumps that appear? and burst behind the, the goat's ears. Uh, we have been told that it's CL and very dangerous and contagious, but none of our goats have died or gotten ill as a result. I'm gonna um, refer that one over to Tony. I don't, I don't know what she's talking about. I've never heard of that. Uh, I, it, has she, I, I wonder if she's talked to her vet about it because I've, I've, never, I've never run into that. All right. Any other questions from from the audience? <clears throat> um, I have one other one um, having to do with another kind of uh, practice the uh, of young male lambs and castration. I know is sometimes sometimes used. Um, do you do you, either of you do that, or do you have a philosophy uh, an approach to it? I'm going to give this one to uh, Jim first. Sorry, I was trying to figure out what's going on with that. <laughs> Jim, do you happen to be on your phone also? And uh, the phone's and your dead. Computer? The phone's oh. on. So I don't know what. Interesting. Okay, well, the question has um, uh, uh, that I had was about castration of young male lambs, and if that's something that you found the need to, to practice in your herd. Um, honestly, it would probably be better if I did. I don't. Um, the Toddens are um, mature very, uh, they have, I'm sorry, they hit sexual maturity very young. And so, yes, that can cause a problem. Um, and at this point, we haven't uh, had a demonstration yet. So that is something that we're looking at in the future. Thank you, uh, Jim. Tony, how about you? We do castrate our, our lambs and our kids. Uh, we do it very early when they're about a month old. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's a lot better for the whole herd to have them castrated as they're growing, growing and maturing. Excellent. Thank you for, thank you for, um, for adding to that. Um, any other questions from our audience at this point? Well, if we if there aren't any other questions, I'm just going to close this webinar by saying thank you for joining us, all of you. And um, a recording of it will be available very soon. <clears throat> Actually, if I could ask the presenters to go on mute one more time, that might be helpful. Um, so this webinar will be archived on our website, and I'm also going to email it to you all you know, along with the slides, so that will be help helpful. Um, if you would be so kind, please take a few minutes to complete our survey that's going to immediately follow the webinar. It's just a couple questions, and you can give us some feedback about um, topics that you'd like to see on future webinars and feedback for the presenters. Um, you can also sign up to receive email updates about Fund a Farmer to learn about future webinars, scholarships, and our grant opportunities, of course. And I'd like to give a sincere thank you to both of our presenters, Tony and Jim, for those excellent presentations and really taking the time to answer uh, all the questions that came in from our audience. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. Tony and Jim, do you have anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off? 
No, thank you for allowing us to make our, our comments. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you so much for everybody that joined us, and I hope it was uh, helpful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tony. And I hope that you all have a good rest of the evening, and I hope that we all keep in touch. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.